Hello everyone, welcome to the second session of our discussion on class reptilia. So in the uh, uh, first session we discussed about the salient features of reptilia and in this session we are going to see the classification of uh, uh, class reptilia, uh, the different orders coming under it, different subclasses coming under it etc. So as we uh, discussed in our first session, the classification of reptiles is uh, mainly based on the number and position of the cavities present in the skull which are called as the temporal fossae. So depending upon that, class reptilia is divided into four subclasses and six orders. So uh, these four subclasses are uh, uh, classified depending upon the number and position of the fossae in the skull. So coming to their uh, classification, uh, the first uh, subclass of class Reptilia is Anapsida as you can see here in the diagram. As you see in the uh, diagram, the skull of Anapsids do not have any fossae in the temporal region other than the orbit which is the uh, which is this particular uh, portion this is the shaded region which uh, this in every skull represents the orbit other than that in anapsida you do not find any cavities in the temporal region so or in the temporal region there is no other cavities in the temporal region as a result this particular subclass is termed as anapsids so anapsids uh, uh, anapsids represent uh, one group or one order of living uh, living anapsids and they are our turtles, tortoises etc. The other order which is present in anapsid is extinct. They are not uh, found now. We only have fossil records of that particular order. Coming on to the uh, second uh, subclass of reptilia. The second subclass is parapsida. As you see here in parapsida you can see a temporal, a single uh, temporal fossae on the temporal region. You can see on the other, other side also uh, this particular skull it shows only uh, one side of the skull. Uh, so this cavities, uh, if cavities are present they will be seen paired in both the temporal region. So here you can see a single temporal uh, fossae which is the supratemporal fossae. So the presence of supratemporal or the organism uh, or the uh, organism with a, uh, with a supratemporal fossae in their skull is classified under this subclass which is called as parapsida and the organisms with or the reptiles with an infratemporal fossae which do not have any other fossae in the temporal region. They are having the uh, lower one which is the infratemporal fossae. They are classified under the subclass which is called as synapsida. The speciality of these two subclasses that is uh, parapsida and synapsida is that uh, they do not have any living representatives. We have records of the we have uh, records of this, the organisms belonging to this particular subclasses only from fossil records. All the organisms included in this group are extinct. Coming to the last subclass, the last subclass of uh, Reptilia is Diapsida. Diapsida is a, a subclass which includes most of the living reptiles that you see today. Uh, most of the living reptiles is, uh, uh, comes under this particular subclass which is called as diapsida. As you can see in the diagram, uh, diapsid as the name indicates, di which uh, stands for two. They have both the temporal fossae, the infratemporal as well as the supratemporal fossae. And this subclass include all the uh, other reptiles like the snakes, the lizards, the crocodiles, etc. So uh, all these uh, uh, organisms are included under this particular subclass which is diapsid which has uh, both the temporal fossae, both the supratemporal as well as the infratemporal fossae. So this is the uh, main classification of the reptiles of uh, which includes four uh, subclasses and this classification is not based on any other external features etc. This is solely based on the uh, presence or, or the position and the number of temporal fossae present in their skull. Coming to the outline classification that we are going to discuss in this particular uh, class or this particular class Reptilia. So we will be discussing all the four uh, subclasses as you see, you see here. Uh, the subclass Anapsida, Parapsida followed by Diapsida and Synapsida. 
and we'll be discussing different orders with their examples. So in class in Absida, we'll be discussing or we will be detailing with the order uh, Kilonia and the examples uh, coming and one of the example coming under the particular order. After that in Parapsida, as I said, it is an extinct group. We'll be discussing on one of the extinct group, which is uh, Ichthyosaurus or order Ichthyosauria. And in subclass uh, Synapsida, that is also extinct, we'll be discussing of order uh, therap uh, therapsida and the example Cyanognathus. We'll be discussing or uh, more detailed discussion of uh, this particular subclass uh, will be there in this particular uh, session of class Reptilia, which is Diapsida, which includes three orders. Where all these are living uh, reptiles. One is Rhynchocephalia with the example Spinodon. The other one is Coamata, which includes lizards and snakes. The other one is crocodile, Crocodilia, the order Crocodilia, which includes crocodiles, alligator, gavialis, etc. So this is an outline of the discussion that we are going to have in the in this particular topic. So first in the uh, in the uh, classification and the examples, uh, first we are going to discuss the first uh, subclass, which is an absid and the examples coming under that. So moving on, the first subclass. The in class Reptilia, the subclass Anapsida without any temporal fossae. And you have two orders, as I said, the order Cotylosauria, which is extinct, and order Chelonia, which uh, we are going to discuss in detail, which includes turtles, tortoises, and terrapins. So you can see the uh, pictures of uh, the three uh, sea turtle which uh, you uh, normally call uh, call as a turtle you can see their adaptations because their legs are modified into uh, paddles for swimming etc limbs are modified both the forelimb and hind limbs are uh, variously modified for swimming because they spend most of their time uh, or mostly they are aquatic they come uh, on land to, for laying the eggs that uh, the group is called as the sea turtles uh, the term turtle is variously used. It is a common terminology for both uh, uh, sea turtles as well as the turtles that you see in freshwater. And freshwater turtles are uh, uh, correctly called as terrapins. Freshwater turtles are terrapins, and the sea turtles are uh, are to be correctly called as the turtles. But you uh, use a common term turtle for both. That is uh, the uh, the uh, the turtles that you see in sea, as well as uh, the turtles that you see in freshwater swamps, etc. So that is a common terminology as uh, turtles because uh, I have seen in many uh, of the pet shop uh, they sell this particular thing in the name of turtles. So it is not actually the uh, sea turtle because it is an endangered one. The sale is banned, etc. Uh, the one which is uh, uh, which is for sale in the pet shops is the uh, freshwater uh, turtles, uh, which has many different colors, etc. So they are mostly uh, uh, considered as pets, and you can get it from pet shops. But the other one, the actual turtle, which is a sea turtle, is an endangered one. The sale or uh, uh, the catching, etc., or the poaching, etc., is uh, considered as a crime. Uh, so, uh, coming to uh, terrapins, uh, the terrapins are the ones which you see uh, in our local area. So, how will you dis differentiate between a turtle, uh, a tortoise and a terrapin? So, from this diagrams you can do that. Turtle definitely, as I said, uh, by looking at their limbs. Uh, so see their uh, hind limb as well as the fore limbs. It is variously modified at, at us, uh, in a form of a paddle. Uh, and at the uh, because it is uh, like a nor because they usually seen in uh, sea water they have to swim uh, for uh, greater distances so it is modified uh, like the uh, like a or it is uh, like a paddle which helps in swimming so uh, definitely with that we can identify a sea turtle coming to terrapins which are which is seen in fresh waters and then swamps then wetlands etc they are called as terrapins. So in terrapins, you can also identify terrapins by looking at their limbs. Their limbs are usually webbed. They have a webbed feet. Uh, uh, I think with the uh, the uh, the ones which you see here, 
in our locality are terrapins they are not tortoises because tortoises are having a very snout uh, uh, limbs that you see in this particular uh, diagram so uh, in this particular diagram when you discuss we can see this this is the particular uh, limb of a tortoise but i think what we see in, in our locality is this particular uh, group which uh, we uh, designate them as tortoise actually they are terrapins they are you know, freshwater turtles because you when you see or when you observe their limbs uh, observe their limbs you can see that a small uh, uh, sort of web webbing can be seen in their feet so if there is a webbing in their feet uh, that is called as a terrapin the other one is the turtle and the other one tortoises which are having a very stout a stumpy leg can be seen or a stumpy limb can be seen for uh, tortoises so this are the three groups coming under the order uh, chelonia and in chelonia uh, only one example we'll be discussing in detail only with one example and that will be uh, of uh, chelon midas or the sea turtle so coming to the salient features of this particular order which is chelonia as uh, said earlier they lack both the temporal fossae the body is covered by a, a firm shell which is called as uh, the dorsal piece is called as a carapace and the ventral one is called as the plastron and uh, as we said in the uh, saline feed the discussion of the saline feature they do, uh, they have a ribs which is attached to the uh, carapace and they do not have a sternum they lack uh, jaws or the teeth are absent and if you see this particular diagram which is uh, uh, seen here uh, instead of teeth the jaws is having uh, a horny sheath or a, a plate like structure can be seen in the jaws which is used for chewing the head next uh, and the limb can be withdrawn into the shell for protection and this uh, this is not a general feature uh, this is seen for both tortoises as well as terrapins but this uh, withdrawal of um, neck head and limbs is uh, cannot be seen in the case of sea turtles sea turtles cannot do this but uh, that can be seen in turtles in uh, sorry in the normal uh, terrapins as well as tortoises show this behavior Uh, the limbs can be either the normal limbs as i said it can be normal like this or it can be paddle like or it can also be uh, webbed as in the case of terrapins the eggs are um, or in every case either uh, be terrapins uh, let it be tur sea turtle or let it be uh, tortoises they lay their eggs in land and uh, the females uh, show parental care Uh, so this is uh, regarding the salient features of the order chelonia this is the general feature of uh, the three examples coming under chelonia and now we are going to discuss the uh, example coming under uh, chelonia that is uh, chelon we were taking only one example here which is chelon midas or the green turtle so this is called as green turtle because of the color of their fat Uh, their fat is having a greenish uh, tinge as a result usually it is uh, it is commonly called as green turtle uh, they are marine and they usually feed on seaweeds their head is small their neck is very short and the tail is rudimentary they have limbs which are paddle like bow and you can see that their fore limbs are more paddle like and it is um, uh, much longer than that of hind limbs and they also have their main feature because they are uh, reptiles and they are not uh, uh, completely adapted to live in uh, the salt water as a result they are having salt excreting glands are also present in their eyes which are modified tear glands because when they take in the this water the the water is having high salt which might hamper their internal physiology and to avoid that they excrete the excess salt Uh, from their modified tear glands the females lay eggs in pits dug in the beach and incubation is not uh, done by uh, in this in a particular case parental care is very rare uh, uh, that means they do not incubate the eggs incubation is done uh, in the uh, in in most of the reptiles uh, like turtles etc Uh, uh, tortoises etc they do not incubate sitting over the eggs they lay their eggs and they move on 
and when the eggs hatch out and uh, the young ones uh, come they show uh, the female show the parental care that is with uh, the three groups uh, turtles then terrapins as well as the um, tortoises show this particular behavior so in uh, in kilon midas incubation and uh, hatching is by the heat of the sun so this is and another feature if you observe there uh, the photos of this kilon midas you can see that uh, the shell is somewhat heart shaped it is not uh, like a triangular uh, more or less triangular or oval as you see in the case of uh, tortoises and terrapins mm, the shell of uh, kilon midas or the sea turtle is more or less heart shaped because it is broader in the uh, anterior uh, region and it uh, it is more or less pointed uh, coming towards the posterior end as you see here as a uh, yeah, uh, in this diagram, you can somewhat uh, see this. If you see other uh, pictures, you can definitely see that. This is broader at this end and it is more or less tapering. So, uh, it is said that they are having a heart shaped uh, carapace for this kilon midas. They are said to have a heart shaped uh, uh, carapace. That is, the upper portion of the shell is called as carapace and the lower portion is called as plastron so a carapace is heart shaped in the case of kilon midas so this particular kilon midas um, uh, in in the early part of uh, the or the later part of the 20th century that is in uh, from 1970s etc this uh, particular organism was heavily poached uh, because they were easy to catch because they come uh, during the night for laying the eggs in the beach because uh, and as a result they were heavily poached for their flesh because their flesh is, uh, uh, is said to be very tasty with their green colored fat uh, and it was considered as a delicacy for uh, the particular and also their eggs they lay their eggs that was also taken as a delicacy uh, but as their number declined uh, they were uh, they were marching towards extinction uh, the government or uh, the wildlife uh, departments they take, uh, took up action against this and they considered or they or they uh, gave them a status as endangered and any poaching of their eggs and uh, live turtles the young ones etc whatever it be if you catch them or if you take their eggs etc it will be considered as a crime and because of uh, enforcing such uh, uh, such uh, particular uh, measures now their uh, number is rising and uh, the coast which are uh, they, they do not come in every coast for laying the eggs they have uh, coast which uh, are prefer for laying the eggs mainly uh, it is said that in the bengal region the coast of bengal in bay of bengal uh, they come and lay their eggs so such area uh, where they lay their eggs is also considered to be uh, protected areas uh, where uh, no poaching or no uh, uh, harm to this particular organisms uh, should be done which will be taken or anything uh, being done will be taken as a serious offense uh, uh, and they will be punished under that particular uh, sessions so this is with the uh, first subclass which is uh, 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 the uh, uh, subclass Anapsida and the order as we said there are two orders but only we are taking the example of only the living order which is uh, order Kilonia we took the example of uh, uh, as we said there are three different uh, groups coming under this sea turtles the terrapins and uh, tortoises and uh, you can see the uh, we uh, took the example and we uh, saw in detail uh, or the detailed explanation of one of the example which was Kilon Midas or the sea turtle. So this is with the uh, subclass Anapsida. We are moving on to the uh, second uh, subclass which is uh, Parapsida. So class Reptilia, subclass Parapsida which is having the supratemporal fossae. There is no living representatives in the subclass. All are extinct and there are three uh, examples of this. They are uh, Ariosilis, which is lizard like uh, 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 reptiles, which was larger in size. Larger in size means uh, it was something around a meter or two meter uh, compared to a human, uh, a meter or two meter in size. The fossils were uh, of that size. Next one is Ichthyosaurus, which is uh, fish like reptiles, and the other one is Plesiosaurus. They were also you know, marine uh, reptiles, but they do not resemble a fish. 
the ones which resemble the fish is uh, classified under uh, the group which is called as ichthyosaurus so these are the three groups of organisms coming under this subclass which is parapsida which were having a supratemporal fossae and mind you uh, we uh, th these uh, uh, pictures are just uh, the animated versions of the fossils that means they have animated how uh, or over the fossil and they have attained or come to this particular shapes actually no one have seen uh, these particular groups in this form we have only the fossil records of these these are just uh, an uh, artistic uh, imaginary of the fossils which uh, we have uh, uh, got from different places so in this particular uh, subclass parapsida we will be discussing about uh, ichthyosaurus which is the example which we are going to take for our discussion so we will be discussing on ichthyosaurus so ichthyosaurus belong to the class uh, order called uh, sorry uh, ichthyosaurus or uh, uh, the example it belong to the order ichthyosauria as i said it is a fish like reptile with many aquatic modifications or aquatic features mainly their body was uh, spindle shaped head with a snout as that you see in the case of dolphins then a head with a long snout as in dolphins and sharp teeth in both the jaws limbs were modified into pa uh, paddles and this uh, limbs they showed two important features one is called as hyperdactyly and hyperphalangy so hyperdactyly is uh, more number of fingers which are usually called as digits so if you compare it with the uh, hyperphalange in humans example of hyperphalange in humans six number of fingers is hyperphalange so increase in the number of fingers is referred to as hyper uh, sorry uh, increase in the number of fingers is referred to as hyperdactyly not hyperphalange hyperdactyly that means increase in the number of digits at this six digits in humans is referred to as hyperphalange so uh, this particular group showed more number of, of uh, the bones of uh, this uh, digits compared to the uh, uh, their uh, compared uh, when compared to the uh, other groups in the same uh, in the same fossils and they also showed hyperphalange so phalanges are nothing but the bones that you see in the fingers uh, bones of the fingers it is not bones of the palms or palms of the palm of the wrist as you see in this uh, uh, diagram which this is of a human i just put this for uh, for your more uh, understanding so uh, this is the bones of the wrist this is the bones of the palm and this pieces of the fingers as uh, referred to as or the bones of the fingers as referred to as the phalanges so uh, uh, more number of uh, phalanges or the bones of the fingers is referred to as hyperphalange so they exhibited two conditions hyperdactyly increase in number of uh, uh, the finger bones and the other one is or uh, the increase in the number of fingers or digits and the other one phalange is increase in the number of bones of the fingers so this was exhibited by this particular group called as ichthyosaurus when compared to the other groups belonging to the same uh, uh, same subclass another thing was because of their or uh, as a feature of their aquatic adaptation they had a caudal or a caudal as well as a dorsal fin so uh, uh, in this particular diagram so this is an uh, ichthyosaurus fossil which is observed and it is from such fossils we derived all these features all these features which was listed here for ichthyosaurus is derived from this particular thing so um, as you can see here though so this is their forelimb so you can see this is modified or this is uh, do not have the shape of a limb of a terrestrial reptile it is more or like or it is more or like that of a uh, whale or a dolphin uh, which is having uh, phalanges or the fingers in this particular manner uh, it is by such calculations they uh, derive at the conclusion that they were aquatic and they had uh, or uh, uh, they had or um, uh, what are the uh, uh, it was paddle like they had a um, uh, fins etc their body was findle shaped they had a long tail etc is derived from such conclusion as i said earlier from such fossils they uh, recreate their shape which uh, we saw in the previous slide so this is also the ichthyosaurian fossil and another uh, important feature that was uh, discovered uh, 
uh, discovered in the uh, in the 20th centuries uh, 20th century was uh, quite uh, surprising um, uh, uh, discoveries from the uh, fossils uh, it was discovered that uh, the fossils of ichthyosaurus which was uh, uh, which was dug out from different places it exhibited embryos inside the fossil so uh, you can see that how a fossil uh, is uh, how a fossil is and uh, they have uh, come to the conclusion that most of the ichthyosauran fossil which were dug out they contain embryos within it the first uh, uh, sort of an embryo was uh, found in one of the fossil and only one single embryo or they did use the presence of a single uh, embryo in it single embryo in the sense that you cannot see the complete embryo that's one reason because it is a fossil most of the uh, 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 most of the bones might have gone might have broken etc so what they found what uh, you can see a diagram uh, a picture representation here so in this particular area of the fossil they found a vertebra a piece of the vertebra not even a complete vertebra a piece of vertebra okay and also some of the uh, some of the cartilages uh, imprints of some of the cartilages and uh, they also found that the vertebra which were present is not similar to that of the uh, adult organism so it was an embryonic one which was being uh, which was at the uh, earlier stages of their growth. So uh, such evidences led to the fact that uh, this particular group of organism, ichthyosaurs, uh, they carry their embryo uh, 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 inside their body. So uh, it might be or it might be OV VV Paris. It might not be completely VV Paris. It might be OV VV Paris. So such uh, conclusions uh, regarding how uh, they uh, they give birth to the young ones is still unclear but scientists have found multiple embryos in the first one it was only a single embryo but in uh, other uh, structures or other uh, studies so uh, in in this particular fossil they found the pieces of the embryo from this particular portion uh, that means uh, uh, this uh, uh, the embryonic uh, vertebra etc and in later studies with another fossil they found that they carried not a single embryo multiple embryos that means something around eight embryos were also em embryonic uh, structures were also discovered from another fossil so these are uh, the the ideas or the uh, uh, the the features or the characteristic feature that you uh, that you assume or hypothesize from the fossil records of uh, such uh, reptiles so this is regarding ichthyosaurus and uh, when you uh, when we uh, study the uh, fossil we should know how the fossil uh, was and how they recreate the fossil so uh, every time the fossil will not be like this clearly placed uh, with everything like uh, this that means from head to tail clearly placed etc uh, fossils never come in their exact form because they might be crumbled like this can you see here this is an ichthyosaur it is a crumbled one because uh, when it was dead all the uh, other parts might have crumbled on uh, the particular region etc so this is also another you can see that the head is like this this is another uh, pterosauran fossil that means a flying reptile fossil you can see that no, it is not a complete one so uh, from this you can deduce this is the portion where the wings like structures might be etc because the imprints was present like that so this is how fossils come and the, it is uh, the very big uh, task of the or a herculean task uh, like finding the nemo it is a herculean task of the paleontologist or the geologist to uh, come to uh, an exact uh, uh, view of this how this might be and uh, come to a particular conclusion uh, to which it belongs etc uh, so this is uh, regarding the fossil or when you talk about a fossil uh, we uh, we should not miss a particular uh, individual uh, who was unrecognized in the early century uh, for their contribution but recognized in the newer days and uh, she is none other than 
uh, who we are going to talk about is Mary Anning. So Mary Anning was, uh, or uh, she is said to be the unsung hero of fossil discovery, or the girl who revolutionized uh, paleontology. So Ma Mary Anning, uh, uh, she was born in the Western England region, which is called as Lyme Ridges. So uh, the region, which is Lyme Ridges, uh, uh, she lived in. Uh, she lived. Uh, near the uh, the cliffs of this particular area, which is called as uh, Lime Ridges. Cliff means nothing but the very big uh, uh, rocky structures that you see near the sea. Okay, and these uh, particular cliffs, that means they are uh, completely uh, uh, rocky uh, regions. Uh, it might be uh, having the length or a height of a mountain, etc., which is seen uh, near the sea. You might have seen in pictures or uh, in films, etc., such regions where you have uh, uh, the very high uh, mountain like structures which are called as cliffs, which is very near towards the sea. So, uh, she and her family lived in such uh, cliffs of this western England region, and the speciality of these cliffs are they are usually subjected to landslides. That means parts of its break off. And uh, the speciality of this region was that uh, these cliffs, uh, they, uh, they were the hidden treasures of many of the fossils. Many fossils were preserved in the cliffs of this particular region. And the uh, importance of this particular lady, Mary Anning, who was born in uh, 1799, was that uh, she was considered to be the pioneering of uh, uh, paleontology and a fossil collector. Uh, so, uh, uh, she didn't have any because of the particular uh, social uh, circumstances uh, uh, in that particular uh, time. She didn't have a formal education because formal education was uh, restricted for uh, royals and also males. Uh, lay, uh, females uh, were restricted from gaining uh, knowledge, etc. They were completely excluded from scientific society. Even the natural uh, or the uh, uh, the natural uh, uh, society for uh, geology, London, uh, they didn't allow women to attend their meetings to present their scientific findings. So they were completely uh, uh, if, uh, mm, they were completely uh, out of the scene. That means women were not allowed to attend or present, or they were. Uh, not part of the particular geological society or the Royal Geological Society till 1904. And as a result, she was not, uh, she was also ignored by the society in her days. And her contributions were later, uh, were later, uh, were later recognized by the society. And now her fossils in the name of Mary Anning Fossils is now uh, exhibited in the Natural History Museum, London. So she was a paleontologist or, uh, who was recognized uh, 100 or 150 years after her death. She was not considered because of the prevailing social conditions, etc. So coming to her story, uh, she was uh, born in a very poor family. Uh, her father was a, a cabinet maker or an amateur fossil collector because they lived near the cliff. As I as I said, when there are uh, there were uh, continuous landslides in the area, and when landslides occur, uh, it will uncover fossil record and curious uh, fossils were obtained, and they they earned a living by selling these fossils. So many people would come who come to the uh, beaches, they will uh, collect this fossil as a souvenir, uh, as a souvenir or a, uh, a piece which can be kept in their uh, house as a showpiece, etc. So they were selling this uh, uh, particular fossils and uh, uh, what uh, made or what remarkable of this lady was that uh, because of their, because they, uh, they were collecting the fossil in there uh, along with her father in her childhood, uh, as a curious, uh, uh, as a curious thing, which can be sold and uh, that can uh, make their living. But after that, uh, when uh, because out of their curiosity, once a lady named Elizabeth, 
uh, who was uh, in the royal society or the, who was uh, uh, in uh, the uh, royal family she presented her a book because uh, this particular uh, uh, lady named elizabeth she usually come to them and collect the fossil as a, uh, this particular fossils as a curios uh, to keep in their palace and uh, once she gave her a book uh, which uh, depicted all these organism and it was from then she realized that uh, these are not just curios which are just buried these are the remainings or remains of the animals as she did not as mary did not have any uh, formal education uh, uh, any formal education in this particular field but because of their curiosity of uh, her curiosity she earned uh, the art of reading and also she earned uh, the knowledge in anatomy uh, and also this uh, fossil records by uh, by experience by uh, reading the books or also by communicating with the uh, the uh, scientists or well known scientists who come to her to collect the fossil so the very uh, sad thing was that most of the uh, uh, the well established scientists come to her uh, talk to her uh she collects or uh, they collect the knowledge that means uh, the one thing that uh, she did was even though she didn't have any scientific uh, knowledge or skill what she did was she would uh, write or uh, she would uh, write this particular uh, about the fossils that means from where she uh, got uh, got the fossil from which height she got the fossil from the cliff and uh, what was its length how it looked and also she used to draw the uh uh the uh, fossil or the uh, or uh, make a depiction of the fossil and also in a paper like how you do uh, we do our scientific drawing etc she, uh, she used to make a, a depiction of that particular one and she would keep as a record so many uh, well known scientists of that particular time they would come uh, they would collect the fossil uh, which would because it was her living so she uh, she would get the price of that they will also take this account and they will be publishing it or they will be uh, taking the uh, uh, the particular uh, Uh, name or the particular uh, subject or the particular uh, thing which they publish in their name uh, they take all the credit of that uh, without uh, uh, even uh, acknowledging her uh, for her fossils so that was uh, going on and uh, the uh, the relation between uh, the fossil ichthyosaurus and mary anning is that at the age of 11 she lost her father and uh, they were uh, to run their family they have to depend only on selling this fossil so uh, whenever landslide happen they go to the cliff they collect their uh, fossil remains etc and at the age of 12 uh, she discovered uh, a very uh, big fossil which was uh, around 5.2 meter in length and that was a fossil of ichthyosaurus so uh, the at that particular time as we know now we know that this particular organisms are uh, the uh, or fossils are the remainings of the organism which existed in the uh, existed in the early days which is not exists now. now such a view was not accepted in that time because in that particular time uh, the belief was that god created organisms and what he created exist now they do not uh, they uh, they do not have any idea of evolution because uh, darwin proposed the idea of evolution after 1850s this is happening in 1823 uh, uh, 1830 in that particular time you know, only in 1860s darwin proposed the idea of evolution which was also rejected in that particular time so uh, they believed or uh, the uh, people or even the scientists believed they do not believed in what is called as evolution as a result uh, these fossil records were not uh, given uh, given that uh, the uh, the importance of uh, that particular fossil and the theory of extinction that means organism can become extinct and they will not be seen after the extinction etc uh, the theory of extinction by the famous scientist called as q weaver uh, was uh, put forth in that particular period and that was also not accepted by the time 
the astonishing thing was Cuvier, uh, he was uh, the well-known or uh, a very uh, great paleontologist of the time of Mary uh, Anning. He also did not uh, uh, accept in the uh, except for the first uh, in the first meeting that uh, this is a fossil of an organism which was extinct so it was after many uh, many meetings in the society it was uh, uh, it was convinced that organism can become extinct and the theory of uh, extinction was accepted and Mary, after that, she uh, uncovered many important skeletons like Plesiosaurus, which is a flying reptile. And also, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, she uh, she did was she could uh, jumbled up. Uh, uh, she had a special uh, interest in uh, putting it in the correct order because she had an idea of anatomy, etc. So she had because uh, of her knowledge, she used to put uh, the bones in correct order or the particular pieces in correct order and Mary died of breast cancer in 1847 and she was buried in uh, Lyme Regis itself and only in this uh, uh, extraordinary scientific discoveries of her lifetime because only she was a lady or a, uh, she was a woman her discoveries were not uh, accepted when she was alive it was accepted only in the 20th century only in the 20th century, uh, the natural society of uh, scientific society uh, opened their doors for women. Uh, the uh, the scientific uh, field was closed till 1904 for women. Whatever they find, or they were not given the formal education also. So only after 1904, uh, the doors of uh, science or scientific discoveries was opened to women, and only after that. Uh, when um, the others began to come across this uh, Mary Anning's fossil, she was recognized. And now there is a particular place in the Natural History Museum of London where the fossils of Mary Anning's are only exhibited. And it is only when a woman attained equal uh, rights as men, she was recognized. So she was recognized after her birth. So this particular portion of Mary Anning is not uh, a part of uh, uh, the uh, curriculum. I included this particular thing is that it was necessary for us to recognize a person, uh, as I mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the uh, introduction of her, that is, she was an unsung hero. So we need to sing her praises from now again. It should not be unsung because uh, her her uh, tedious work or her uh, uh, patience because uh, paleontology requires more skill and patience. So that's something uh, is to be recognized. So uh, that's why we uh, I uh, put this particular session and this discussion in uh, this particular uh, uh, discussion of class reptilia which is here and another significant uh, thing is that uh, it is uh, claimed that uh, the story of Mary Anning is an inspiration of the tongue twister uh, that is uh, she uh, she sells seashells on the seashore it is uh, the particular uh, tongue twister is, uh, has been uh, claimed to be uh, taken from her uh, uh, from uh, inspired from her and uh, this her life is also inspired for many documentaries and also films uh, you can search uh, in the uh, youtube for that many there are many documentaries there are many animated uh, you know, versions of her life etc that can be seen here so from now onwards let's sing the praises of such unsung heroes in uh, science uh, so uh, with this uh, i am uh, we we'll stop the session in the next session, we'll be coming up with the other two subclasses, subclass Synapsida and subclass Diapsida. Thank you for hearing. So for any doubts uh, and uh, queries, you can uh, either post in the WhatsApp group or you can post in the, uh, in the uh, Google Classroom. Thank you.